Uh, well, I'd like to welcome the uh, members of the Health and Wellness Committee to this roundtable discussion, as well as the audience around the world. Uh, we are really glad that we can do this roundtable discussion today, right just before the juries and recitals. And we are grateful for the audience that uh, popped in and participated. Um, I am going to Agitali to Katrin Peters, who will be the moderator, and she's also a member of the Health and Wellness Committee. So, Katrin, yours is the stage. Thanks so much, Tava. Um, audience, thank you for joining us. Um, and if you are listening in later, um, we really appreciate you taking some time to, to join us for this conversation. Um, we welcome you, those that are here, to drop some questions or comments that you might have into the chat window. Um, and if you are watching this later, um, drop those down into the comments, or you can always send us an email as well. Uh, we will be using those questions later this year uh, as we continue our conversation about mental health in the musical community. Okay, so I'm gonna let the panel members introduce themselves, um, briefly give your name and where you're coming from. Hi, I'm Megan Merciers. I uh, teach clarinet at the University of North Alabama and I'm also an administrator there. Hi, I'm Rebecca Rishan. I'm the clarinet professor at Ohio University and chair of the Woodwind Division. And I've been teaching here since 1995. I'm originally from San Francisco, California. Am I next? Okay. Hi, I'm Laura Grantier. I teach clarinet at the University of Utah. I am also the secretary for the International Clarinet Association and the state chairperson for the state of Utah. I'm originally from Mississippi and also spent 26 years in the US Navy Band in Washington, DC. Hi, I'm Shannon Hewitt. I am a clarinetist and low clarinetist with the uh, President's Own United States Marine Band and I'm also their fitness specialist and I've been a member there for, I've been in the military for over 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to all of you for being here and for sharing with us. Um, I'm still getting to know all of you, so I'm really, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say on this topic. Um, I have way more questions than we have time for, uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our first one. I want you to complete this sentence for me. Finish this sentence. Performance anxiety is... Manageable, scary, <laughs> nerve wracking. Created by ourselves. Possible to have and resolve. Hey. Not fun. Okay, these are these are some these are some interesting answers. Um, okay, is there a way? that you've seen performance anxiety shown up that was unexpected, uh, either in your own experience or in the experience of maybe a student, but how have you had it show up that was like, did not see that coming? I once went to a performance and the performer actually fainted. And I, I found out afterwards that they had taken too many beta blockers. So believe it or not, you know, you can faint from taking too many beta blockers because it lowers your heart rate so much, your blood pressure. So be careful with beta blockers. That that certainly would be unexpected. <laughs> when I was um, in, oh sorry, when I was in grad school in the eighties, along that um, that was the first time I ever heard of beta blockers, and I had a friend who was a professional flutist, uh, the wife of one of my professors, and she got so nervous that she would take them, but what she did is she her dosage was like half a pill she said like half of one was enough to kind of take the edge off and that was the first time i'd heard of someone going to like that level like taking meds to um you know deal with that yeah so definitely it sounds like more than that amount for probably most people it's probably yeah yeah too much yeah you can't have too much of it yeah I think another place that uh, it can show up <laughs> unexpectedly is uh, being a member of the president's own, you know, we're touring all around 
and performing walking into a performance venue as a soloist and it's freezing cold mm -hmm. ah that's and interesting so you feel like that environmental it's an environment yeah and and it's something that you weren't prepared for or maybe you didn't think to prepare for it and you show up and you're like how do i deal with this amen um, <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah, exactly and right? it just kind of starts a ball rolling huh your, your instrument can crack, you know, that you're so worried about your instrument cracking, you can't perform. Or your fingers just don't move. Tunnel <laughs> <laughs> yeah. vision and blacking out have been, are two ways that I've, uh, I've had students oh. that have encountered that. Wow. We, we have a hand raised from Ohio Valley Hypnosis. Oh, hi, that's me, David. You're sorry. Hi, David. Um, yeah, this is all great. Interesting to hear. I, um, I, uh, after my undergrad, um, I've been playing about 40 years after my undergrad, um, I went and did an audition for a very well known clarinet teacher at a famous program and the clarinet teacher had just met me and I played well, very well, I thought, um, but the teacher decided to just like, in retrospect, try to psychologically destroy me, basically told me I sucked and that I would take a job away from a real musician, blah, blah, blah. I'd never encountered anything like this before. Maybe, maybe some of you have, uh, I didn't have any idea that was coming out of left field. And it, um, it, uh, it led to me developing a condition called focal dystonia where I lost control when I was playing in the middle finger of my left hand, uh, to you would be this hand. Uh, and, um, so yeah, I had that for about 30 years. Um, after that, audition experience and I was able to play through it. I didn't share it with anyone because I didn't want anyone to think I was damaged or, you know, that it would take away gigs. Um, but uh, I tried everything and eventually I was able to resolve it through my current work um, through, um, I do a technique called brain spotting, which I discovered a few years ago and that helped me finally release it after 30 years. And now I, I do that work with other musicians, clarinetists as well. So yeah that was something i had never heard of focal dystonia didn't know what that was at that point the internet wasn't around so it was kind of like i had to just kind of research on my own and talk to people and and then um kind of be my own expert on it yeah and try tried everything i didn't do botox that was when botox first was coming in like way before beauty <laughs> uh they were you know still use it on some occasions to treat this um I, I didn't go there. And then there's also deep brain surgery, which is happening now uh, in Asia somewhere. And I'm like, yeah, I think that's that's a bridge too far for me. Um, but I tried to, something else. Yeah. Anyway. Glad to hear that that you have been that you have improved that that's not a struggle for you anymore. Laura, you were um, about to say something, I think. Who me? Oh, uh, no, I was trying to make Saba the host. <laughs> oh, gotcha. I gotcha. Sorry. Okay, then let me go on to my next question. Um, this actually ties into um, what Shannon was saying. Have you ever felt like um, there has been an instance where that anxiousness was tied to either a specific place or a specific person? Ooh, yeah. I see. But again, leave out, leave out maybe uh, identifying details and we don't need to hear about exactly who, but can you think of, cause I can think of people, especially that I have played with, um, you know, for like ongoing basis that I feel different around them. And I'm curious, do you ever have that experience where you go into a place or you go in front of a specific audience and you feel more anxious? Yeah, I think a lot of us, uh, we create that anxiety because we're trying to play for, we're trying to impress someone else or, or um, and we have to remember, we can't really change what people think, the outcome, you know, we have to play for ourselves. And that's a really hard thing to do because we as musicians set our expectations so high. So yes, every environment we, in, we are in is going to be different. Um, you know, whether you're in an ensemble and you're trying to play well for the the conductor, whoever's up there, or your colleagues. I know for me, it's really, you know, I've got these colleagues who are amazing musicians, and I have that expectation to kind of live up to that. So it's harder for me to play around them than to try to play well for an audience. 
I agree. I think it's it's much easier to play for an audience that you don't know than for an audience you do know. I find when my audience is anonymous, you know, if I'm going out on a tour and giving a concert somewhere, I'm much less nervous than if I'm playing for people I know well. But I think, Shannon, what you said about we worry what other people think, I think it's important to remember that, you know, most people are not thinking about ourselves. Most people are so focused on themselves, they're not thinking about other people. So we tend to kind of magnify what other people think. And most of the time, they're not thinking about us at all. They're just thinking about their own lives. Which is a really interesting point to what Shannon um, said, because I can think of a lot of people in our community who would look at someone like Shannon and be like, I would be nervous to play in front of you right? <laughs> because she is one of those people that we see and we look at like, wow, I wish I could play that way. Megan, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that I think anxiety sometimes follows um, when you're in situations where you perceive that you're going to be judged. Um, and so one of the perspective changes I, I try to do, and I try to put myself in situations where I feel like I'm sharing something with the audience, I'm sharing a gift with others, uh, where I feel supported and encouraged. Megan, that's true for like, especially auditions, because here we're kind of talking mm -hmm. about, you know, performing a, in a concert or something, but what you're saying, like, how do you deal with that with, with an audition, you know, like? It's a good question. It's a, it's again, a perspective shift where you're, you, you go through so many levels of preparation that you're ready to share that with, with the panel. I do find that when it's a blind audition behind a screen, I find that to be uh, less nerve wracking than when, when you're face to face with, with people as well. Well, there again, you're removing that connection, like that by nature is a very judgmental, you know, kind of scenario. It has to be. Um, and so by having that removal of, I can actually see those people, I, I could see that being less nerve wracking for sure. Have you ever found yourselves in a position or have you ever had a student that shared with you, um, that they are nervous because maybe they're not pers like that perceiving of judgment is just not all in their head. Maybe the person that has been listening to them has been um, exercising quite a bit of critical, you know, judgment uh, on them. I think that's- I think as an educator, you, you step in, you, I, I think constructive criticism is a part of what we do. Um, however, I think uh, being careful to, I mean, you've, most people or several people have heard of um, the educator's compliment sandwich where you you state a positive and then you you go for something that's more constructive and then you end with a, a positive note. And I, I do think that we try and practice that. I teach in an environment where it's a shared studio um, with uh, Dr. Kelsey Paquin and myself at the University of North Alabama. And so in studio classes, we focus on um, how how students can engage and interact and provide constructive criticism as well. I want to second the sandwich. You took mm -hmm. the words out of my mouth. I, yeah, the sandwich, the positivity sandwich, yeah, is always helpful. I find along being a private teacher too, sometimes I've had students that, you know, you have them for many years and you form like a really deep, you know, great connection with them. and. I had one student who was a young male student, one of my high achievers, and he came in one day and he just burst into tears. And so I saw that we weren't going to spend the time doing much playing of the clarinet that day, but it was like, hey, what's going on? And so sometimes as a teacher, you know, we can kind of be that outside opinion that's not their parents or their teachers, you know, like the classroom teachers, but we can kind of be that friend, that sounding voice, sounding space for them to kind of, you know, and it, it just happened that he was under a lot of pressure with school and his parents and other things. And he didn't feel like he came in prepared. And I'm like, you know, hey, it's all right. We all have those moments, you know, in life. And sometimes that's what the student needs, sometimes more than playing the clarinet. Sometimes, you know, is that life support, you know. Well, um, on, the, on the topic of um, like, that's kind of something that we all experience. Um, what 
do you think is an acceptable level of anxiousness? In other words, um, how much or how often should we expect that, yeah, we're gonna feel uncomfortable? What is an acceptable line? Megan? I think when it when it crosses into the border of irrational anxiousness, despite lots of preparation, that's my answer for that one. I agree, I agree with, with, with me. Sorry, go ahead, Shannon. Uh, no, it's okay, Rebecca. Uh, I was just going to say one uh, one quote that was told to me uh, by by a friend and colleague was, "You cannot create and criticize at the same time," and that has stuck with me. And if it does cross the line, like Megan said, where you're constantly criticizing in your head, you cannot create, and you don't want to get into that space. Those are yeah, really no, I... sides of the brain, actually. Yeah. You've got the critical side and then you've got the creative side. Literally, that's kind of what's happening physiologically. Yeah. I think it's important to remember that stage fright is normal. Everyone gets nervous, even like really famous performers like Barbara Streisand. She wouldn't do live performances for years. She just made recordings because she had stage fright. I'm told that Frank Sinatra, who was a legend, used to vomit before each performance. So, you know, everyone gets nervous, but there's a difference between just having stage fright and being so anxious that it incapacitates you and you cancel performances or you avoid performing altogether because you just can't bear to deal with the level of anxiety that you have. Yeah, John Lennon used to throw up before every Beatles show. Same thing, <laughs> he said. I, I think you have to define what anxiety is because it's gonna be a different thing for each person and we all have individual life histories that get us to this point and so some people are just naturally able to handle certain levels of stress. Uh, sometimes we normalize levels of stress. Maybe that might not be, we may normalize a higher level of stress than in our everyday life than what is healthy for us. Yeah. So yeah, I kind of think it depends for each person, but yeah, I, I agree with the irrational piece too, that if it, if it feels like it's impacting you, a certain level of stress is necessary for us, um, for us to, to grow into progress, but then you have to balance, it has to be balanced, right? With so, it. The, oh, sorry, it, go ahead. It's been found that, um, because I've done a lot of research on performance anxiety and techniques, and actually I presented a paper for ICA a while back at the Sweden conference and have done an article for the magazine um, back a couple years. And it's been found the more you perform or the more you put yourself in situations where you get anxious, the better you get at handling it. And I wanted to comment on beta blockers in a second, um, because I think a lot of musicians and students think that that's the answer, and it really isn't. And also beta blockers, you cannot get unless you have a prescription. So don't, if your friend is getting a beta blocker for their um, uh, heart condition, don't you know say oh can you give me a couple pills i have an audition coming up that's not really a good idea beta blockers they control the nerve impulses they block adrenaline it reduces uh sweat it slows your heartbeat now some of the other things that it also does it affects your short-term memory uh it makes your pulse unusually slow uh you get cold hands and feet you can get dizzy uh it covers the physiological component of performance anxiety. It doesn't cover the psychological aspect of performance anxiety. And this was also interesting. It can uh, affect your perception of dynamics and rhythm. So uh, it's, um, it, it's, you know, and I had a student that really, she didn't think she could get through her jury and she wanted me to write a note so she could get uh, you know, she could take it to a doctor and get beta blockers. I said, you know, there are natural things that you can do to reduce your performance anxiety. And the other thing is, which I always feel uh, good, and um, European school compared to American school, in the European school of te clarinet teaching, it's mostly you're playing in a master class for your other students, for younger students, for students uh, your own age. So you're always, every week, you have, or every two, two times a week, whatever it is, 
you have that small performance where you're playing for other people. American school, we have once a week master classes. Sometimes we perform, sometimes we don't. But until we get to our, our jury or our um, recital, we don't have um, a big time uh, situation. So European players are more used to playing for people. And you, like I said, you do get better at uh, actually, I'm more nervous talking here than I am at playing on stage. But you do get better at handling performance anxiety. One thing I always stress to my students, you know, the the um, for their juries, you know, the the jury wants you to do well. They're not looking to you know sink your ship. And also, no matter what happens in your jury, when you go home, your dog will love you. They don't care, <laughs> you know. So, anyways, and. Um, yeah, so I mainly wanted to get that in about beta blockers because, you know, they have some pluses, but they also, and also one other thing, uh, you can, um, the more you take beta blockers, you have to up the dose after a while because they won't have the same effect. Um, and from uh, my research, there are a fair number of professional orchestral musicians that uh, depend on beta blockers just to get through a uh, rehearsal, not even a performance. So it's, it's not a good idea to um, go to them unless it's the absolute last resort. You've tried other things, <clears throat> relaxation techniques, visualization, things like that. So just to get a, you know, two cents in. Megan. I'd like to add something, though. I do think that there's a negative stigma uh, or stigma associated with the use of pharmacological options. And I think it's a very subjective thing. You said something at the very beginning, Dan, which I completely agree with. Uh, it, it's that you should always do this under consultation with a, a doctor if you're going to do anything pharmacological. Um, and I think that's very, very important. Um, uh that and it's important to know that it's so subjective person to person um as well and so i i i don't want to take that off of the table as something that's an alternative if it's um if it's a student or someone that suffers from crippling anxiety and all they need is something that will help uh deal and they've gone through all kinds of other resources and and all they need is something that will block the adrenaline and a very small dose might be something that will help them. I also think that with beta blockers, um, it, it can become something that you you do rely on. Uh, and I, I don't think that that is necessarily the best thing in the world. But I also think that there are circumstances where people can take a beta blocker and experience uh, the lack of the uh, adrenaline response. And they think, oh, I finally have this freedom in my performance. And, I, you know, it just depends. It may be that they needed to have that one experience and then they don't need beta blockers to, to continue. But um, I, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to ask um, uh, Sherry Rolfe to uh, be on our panel, who's also on our committee because she's an MD. And I think this is a great uh, expert content area for her as well. Yeah, I was about to ask her, Sherry, would you like to chime in on this conversation? I'd love to. Um... Beta blockers get a really, really bad rap from a lot of musicians. And I think a part of that is um, a lack of understanding of pharmacology. Uh, beta blockers are arguably the safest drug on the market today. They've been around for 50 plus years. Um, so we know a lot about them. I think that a lot of musicians get into the problem, as Dan suggested, that they go and they say, um, uh, hey, could you get me a couple of Uncle Ted's beta blockers because I've got an audition coming up. Well, the thing is, yeah, you need to have a physician's supervision. But even more importantly, this is one case where, you know, you've heard the admonition, don't try this at home. Do try this at home. I think that that is where a lot of musicians get into a negative mindset because they haven't said, okay, I'm just going to sit down here with um, 
10 milligrams of Enderol uh, this afternoon at the house. I'm going to go and I'm going to practice. I'm going to have lunch. I'm going to see how I feel in two hours. Um, that is something that I absolutely believe needs to happen. The other thing about beta blockers is, much as Megan was um, uh, just saying, is that when you take a beta blocker and you perform and uh, on stage suddenly your hands aren't um, shaking, um, all of the moisture that used to be in your mouth but then goes to your bladder, um, that's not something that you're really experiencing. And learning occurs, um, which is really an important thing. So um, the idea of getting hooked on beta blockers is um, pretty remote if, they, if they're used properly under appropriate supervision. Um, I think if you can get through, if it takes, if it takes a little bit of a beta blocker to get through a couple of performances, then I do think that you can learn from that, learn a lot, and then it may not be necessary anymore. And the thing is, um, you aren't taking the beta blockers on a regular basis. So you don't have to worry about you know, your, your heart rate uh, bottoming out and passing out. Um, you don't have to worry about, uh, I mean, cold hands. You're going to get cold hands if you're extremely nervous. Um, and that's not really going to be as much of a problem with a beta blocker. Um, so uh, I have to say that I think that there is a place for beta blockers. Now, if somebody wants to go out and do a benzodiazepine, different deal. I think that's totally inappropriate if, uh, to, to try that route. I think that there are uh, players, usually more, usually more in the jazz type of setting, that go out and uh, they, need a, they need a few beers before they go out and get on stage. Again, I think that's, that's completely inappropriate. That doesn't really help the situation at all. It, in fact, makes it worse. So... I would just encourage folks not to give beta blockers a um, a totally bad rap right off the top. Um, I think they can be extraordinarily useful. I guess I'm curious um, to ask Sherry, um, you know, about the specific medications. Um, what do you think is better about a beta blocker than some other sort of anxiety medication? Well. First of all, um, a beta blocker is not an anxiolytic. Um, a beta blocker blocks the beta, the beta adrenergic receptors of the nerves that cause you to have all the, 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 the tremulous hands, um, cause you to get the uh, dry mouth, that cause you to perspire. Um, and those sorts of things. Um, it, it's not an anxiolytic. It it doesn't it doesn't mess with your mind, um, like let's say Valium might. Uh, Valium is an anxiolytic. Um, Librium. They're both benzodiazepines, and those are definitely going to um, influence your central nervous system a lot. You're going to get drowsy probably. Um, Everything's going to kind of slow down. Not something that's going to be helpful for a performance situation. The way that I understand it, and Sherry, um, correct me if this isn't correct, but um, the way that I understand it is um, on some of those medications, um, they like beta blockers, for example, they just suppress the physiological um, responses, like the physical response, whereas um, other medications might you might still have those responses, but maybe not care so much <laughs> because they're kind of like lifting the weight of reality a little bit. Um, do I have that correct? 
Yeah, you're pretty much on. You're pretty much spot on with that. Um, um, I keep going back to the benzodiazepines because you know, for a while, Valium was uh, being handed out to people. You know, kind of like aspirins. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's like, well, you know. So I screwed up the second movement. Yeah, not a big deal, you know. Or when I get ready to play the second movement, it's like, oh, it's the second movement. Let's see. And it's going to dull your mind. It's going to slow you down. It's going to make you sleepy. And as you say, Catherine, it's not, not something that you want to do. And the beta blocker is, again, uh, it blocks the physiological uh, end response right at the nerve uh, connections peripheral. Um, there are some people who uh, seem to feel that on a beta blocker, um, that their um, mental responses are slightly blunted. Some people say that if they take a beta blocker, uh, their performance lacks um, spontaneity and it lacks excitement. And um, I really don't, if you're so nervous and so shaky, um, the beta blocker can only help it. And it's not gonna make it worse. Uh, there's another fallacy that I would like to bring up. Um, I was giving a talk about this somewhere and uh, an audience member said, well, hey doc, um, I know a guy that he takes a beta blocker six times a day, every day, just to get through his day now. And he started taking it just for performance anxiety. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. I mean, that just doesn't happen. If somebody's taking that volume of beta blockers, that somebody's going to find him or herself in an emergency room with bradycardia, their heart's going to be beating so slowly and their blood pressure is going to be so low that they're not going to be able to function. Um, and they might even kill themselves. Uh, so you don't get addicted to beta blockers. Um, uh, I've heard a lot of people say that. That is not the case. Okay. Well, thanks, Sherry. Thanks for that input. Um, that, was, that was really helpful. Um, I like the idea of, first of all, discussing it with your doctor, right? Because they're going to have quite a bit of input. Um, I also really appreciated the suggestion that if that is something that you and your doctor decide, yes, is probably beneficial to at least try. Um, the idea of trying it out in a non-pressure situation first, just to see how you react to it is seeming very wise to me. Um, okay, I'm going to completely, not completely, but we're going to get off of that topic and resituate here. Um, I want to know, do you feel like, um, panel, do you feel like your students, you or your students can actually lean on the circles inside the community? music community like do you feel like the people in your musical circles um can be helpful like are they helpful or maybe not so much i wouldn't mind speaking to that um i i i think that absolutely um there's you have your your circle i think if you're in school it's helpful if you have uh those people as well um, but not so. I think a, f a few years back when the stigma surrounding performance anxiety and mental health in general was prevalent, uh, it's getting better because it's out in the open. And I think this generation of students um, especially are so willing to be vulnerable and put themselves out there and have these open conversations that it's getting better. Um, I think that circle is getting larger. Yeah, because I mean, that would not have been something like when I was in college that you would have owned up to, right? Because that makes you look like weak or it makes you look maybe you're not cut out for the rigor of this profession. And I could I could totally see that. Um, I thought I saw Rebecca about to chime in. Yeah, I think um, 
one of the benefits of being in a school environment is you have a lot of people around you. And I believe, as Dan said, I, um, the best way to prepare for a performance is to give a lot of mini performances before that. The best way to overcome any type of anxiety is through gradual exposure. So, you know, if you're afraid to play for a room full of 10 people, first try playing for one person, then maybe play for two people, then for three. You know, the good thing about being in a school, whether it's high school or college or conservatory or wherever, is you have that built-in community, that built-in support. And I know most, you know, music studios have a weekly master class or studio class where you play for one another. And that's the best type of preparation for performance anxiety because, you know, if a clarinetist can play for, for a sea full of clarinetists, that's the scariest ever, you know? Then playing for an audience of who cares what they play, you know, you don't, it doesn't matter at all. It, it seems easy. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we should all capitalize on being in communities, being in universities, conservatories, colleges, um, orchestras, bands, you know, because, um, Playing for and with other people is the best way for coping with this type of anxiety. So it sounds like you're kind of looking for uh, almost like a desensitization, like you're trying to normalize a little bit this aspect of let's play for other people. Um, I've I've even read that there are there's a study out I cannot remember who did it, um, but that suggests that for students, especially like younger students that really struggle with playing in front of people, um, the recommendation is go home and play for your dog or your cat. Maybe not your cat because cats have a way of you know like letting their opinions. Be. Dogs are much more friendly about such things. Shannon, yes, I just want to chime in on this. Um, I agree, playing for people is great. But so many times as you know, clarinetists and musicians, we're constantly pounding this perform, 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 and that can actually create anxiety. So what if you stepped outside of the circle of musicians and, and for instance, like what I've done with fitness, um, I find that that absolutely cured my performance anxiety in a very unique way. Um, I, st I stepped out of music and did something that challenged me in that realm where I found confidence in doing something difficult outside of music in front of people because maybe the person you're dealing with the student you're dealing with has some social anxiety or they're concerned about playing in front of someone because they think that person is so amazing. They don't want to play in front of that person so it really does come down to um, the individual, the environment, but for me stepping outside of music and doing something, for instance, with fitness. Um, what I did completely cured me of um, performance anxiety. I like that you brought that up, Shannon, um, because we do tend to get this hyper focus, hyper fixation on performing, playing, being around musicians. I, when I was thinking about this, I was like, oh, well, you could you could step outside of the box and play for, you know, non-musicians, too. And that might that might assist. But I like your idea or your suggestion of being able to step into something completely different. Um, it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, have you ever, this is like a never like, have you ever had performance anxiety somewhere other than in music? Okay. I will confess. We had company over for dinner one time. Um, and it was a meal that I, like, it's one of my staples. I cook it all the time. And I don't know why, but all of a sudden I started feeling much more rushed and I started feeling much more like, oh, I hope they like this. And I started like in my hurry to get dinner finished, I started doing things in like a weird order. And my husband even comes in at one point and he's like, what did you do here? And I was like, I, I don't know. And he's like, why are you cooking weird? <laughs> this is not the way that you normally do this. Have you ever had that experience where for whatever reason, company's coming over and you feel like you're like more anxious about it and outside of music that that has kind of spilled over? It's interesting. I had a public speaking course in college and uh, the teacher said that most people fear public speaking more than dying. <laughs> so, and, and uh, to be totally honest, I mean, if I'm giving a lecture at a conference or for, you know, 
for anyone or or even now uh, I'm more nervous than if I had my clarinet in my hand and people said okay play this so yeah public speaking is pretty nerve-wracking once you get used to it you get better at it but you know since you know even being a teacher you know how many of us after three months of uh, spring or a summer break um, you know, that first couple lectures of if we're doing a music appreciation class or uh, something, we, you know, it's not with clarinet students that uh, we're a little nervous on. So I like, um, I like what Shannon said earlier about anxiety being much more about what you think the perception of you is going to be instead of like what you're actually doing, what you think about somebody else thinking about what you're actually doing. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious panel, um, when you are in the moment, when you are there in the moment and you feel that stress level starting to, you know, creep up, it's starting to shift to where it's more than just like the normal task of, Oh, I've got to do this thing in front of me what are some ways that you alleviate the symptoms? Because really that's what we can do in the moment, right? Is just alleviate the system, the symptoms instead of the root. But what are some ways that in the moment you alleviate your symptoms so that you can do the task in front of you? Shannon. Well, I think one thing is, um, and this comes down to work on habits and behaviors, just going back to what I do with fitness folks, it totally relates to musicians. But if you think about it, when we're performing and something bad happens, we immediately start snowballing with all the bad things that can happen. And if you think about your personal life, um, think about how easy it's, it is to go from a positive thought to a negative, but how hard is it to go from a negative to a positive? Mm -hmm. And that is something we we have to work on as people and as musicians, and it directly works and relates to performance anxiety in the moment. And if you don't practice that, you can't, you know, get your mind out of that space when you're in a position where bad negative things start to start to happen. So you have to learn how to turn that negative into a positive and work on building those habits and behaviors. Yeah, and that's so going to be on to what Shannon was saying, I, uh -huh. I always think about, I get to do this. How exciting mm -hmm. is it that I get to do that? But I have to put myself in that mindset. It's mm -hmm. not something that just happens. I agree. Yeah. And I think the terminology we use is very important. So, you know, in the midst of a performance, when you have a lot of negative thoughts going through your head where, you know, an error happens, you make a mistake instead of telling yourself, oh, that was awful. That was a big mistake. Just tell yourself that was a little boo boo. You know, a boo boo is more innocuous than a mistake, you know. So if you just change your terminology, that can really change your mindset a lot, you know, to control those negative thoughts, um, you know, or or if you come to a passage um, and you're thinking, oh, no, here comes that awful passage that I always mess up. Instead of thinking that way, think, oh, I have practiced this passage many times, so I'm sure this will pay off in my performance. So, you know, your terminology and how you phrase things in your head makes a big difference. Mm hmm. All right, let's hear from Laura and then Sherry. I was going to say, um, when I'm performing, especially when I was in the Navy band, and I was trying to think that that performance was always bigger than myself. I think one of the things I've had to kind of retrain my thoughts is when I was in the band and I put on my uniform, it was kind of like a coat of armor that I had a job to do. And I was the job. If I had on my Navy uniform, I could go out and really do any job and be the job. But because of what I was representing and putting it into perspective that it wasn't just about me, it was about me and everyone around me and the audience and the listener. And um, I once asked Ricardo Morales, he, he came to uh, Navy band clarinet day and I said, do you ever get nervous? And he said, he said, I do, but I'm just a musician. I'm not a doctor. I'm not, I don't have people's lives in my hands. I'm not saving people's lives as a firefighter. He's like, I'm a musician and I have the, the gift of making music. And I thought that was a really interesting perspective of that he's just trying to make music. I know it's, I'm simplifying it, right? But I will tell you that especially when I was in the band, even now, because I have so many students that I'm 
you know, I, I l- try to live my life by example, playing in front of my students, performing in front of them. And when I was in the band, just having that uniform on and realizing that everybody around me depended on me to do my job and to do it well. And, and that kind of always was in the back of my mind. It's not just about, Ooh, if I squeak or make a mistake, it, it's, you know, doing the best of my job to the best of my ability and also being a team player. So whatever that's worth. Yeah. Thank you. Sherry. Um, first of all, um, I would like to say that I find that the performing music is more difficult than doing surgery. Um, because music, it's a nonstop continuum. If I'm operating and there's a little roadblock, there's always something that I can, well, almost always, something that I can do to give myself a moment to regroup before I go forward. You don't really have that luxury if you're playing a concerto. The very first time I won a concerto competition and I was going to play with the uh, Swanee Festival Orchestra. And um, I was petrified. I mean, I'm just a country girl from Kentucky and, you know, what do I know? And all these people. And there was a professor and a piano student, both of whom were from Oberlin. And... I mean, they saw that Sherry was becoming a gigantimous basket case. So they told me this, and I developed this mantra. I've practiced. I know the piece. Probably nothing is going to go wrong. If something does go wrong, I have no idea where it's going to happen. And if it does, I'll fix it. And I found that if I just went over and over and over with that silly little mantra, it really, really helped me. And I think that that was probably how I did my first successful concerto. Um, You know, I practiced the music. I know it. Odds are nothing's going to go wrong. If it does, I have no idea where it's going to happen. And if it does, I'll fix it. Um, Because I found that if there is that terrible, gnarly little passage that Rebecca was talking about, and there always is, and I found over the years that if I start worrying about, oh my God, we're coming up to letter M. Oh my God, we're almost there. Oh my God, it's coming, it's coming. Probably that part will go fine. And then three bars later, my wheels will fall off. So um, the mindset, once I kind of got myself into that mindset, um, but beta blockers are helpful too. Terry, I love the mantra thing. I'm glad you brought that up because everybody should have a number of mantras they can pull out of their pocket at any time. And it sounds like you've had those same mantras in your pocket for a while. Everybody should just have them. It's, it's another little habit to just have. I agree. And you can even, you know, incorporate a mantra into a deep breathing exercise. You know, on the inhalation, you can say, I am capable. On the exhalation of performing or on the inhalation, I have prepared and on the exhalation for this performance. And then you combine two things, the mantra with the deep breathing to calm yourself down. In all these situations, what's happening is that the mind is in, is jumping in, obviously, and it's critiquing, evaluating, it's remembering past failures in practice, or maybe lack of mastery, or maybe enough time, maybe not enough time to master something if it's in a short period. So, what what works for me and a lot of the clients I work with is I I bring the focus in my work back into my body. So if I'm in rehearsals or performances, I'm literally bringing my awareness back into my body and out of that out of my mind. I'm going, that reconnects me to the bigger picture that connects me to the musicians around me, to life. We love music so much and we love the clarinet a lot as well, right? And so the thing is that love can get in our heads and make us start to obsess over these details and these things. Um, And that's what takes us out of our body. And that's often when the body um, fails to do 
what we've trained it to do. This is the same thing with athletes. You have to, you have to, um, <laughs> Charlie Parker had a great phrase. He basically said, learn all that crap, the scales and the arpeggios, and then forget about that shit, frankly, and just play. And that's exactly what has to happen and happens with high level performers. You have to, the time to worry about that passage of letter H is, is gone by the time you're in performance, you've got to be thinking of something larger units. And that's for me and, you know, being grounded in the body stops all that mind chatter. And then I'm back into the love, the love, the music. And I find I often the passage will often play itself. And that's because I've done all the previous work, the practicing and everything, but I'm even doing that in the practice room too. I'm, I'm constantly bringing myself back into my body because it's very easy to go out of your body and not have physical awareness when you're working on some little detail in your instrument. It happens to everybody. We have to always plug things back together. You know? All right. Thanks. Um, I, I appreciate, um, I think actually like the five of you, um, Shannon, Rebecca, Laura, Megan, and Sherry, like I heard little snippets of something that was in common that sounded very preparatory. Um, like having this habit, having these, um, this reminder, this verbal reminder for yourself, having um, some thing that ties you to performance time. Um, it, it sounds like there's something premeditated um, in, in all of your suggestions. Um, and so I think that that is a really interesting thing, um, that we can think about ahead of time. Like the words, the words I am capable that may or may not like that depends on, I think the person, because it, when you are in the heat of anxiety, your, your brain is kind of like, I don't know that I'm capable. I feel like I'm trying to trick myself into it, but I have prepared is a quantifiable, right? And so that is something that you can like put on and say, I did the work, I did prepare. Um, I've done this this many times or, um, you know, Sherry over, over the course of her playing career, she said that she started out, you know, as this, this girl from, what do I know? I'm just this girl from Kentucky. Um, and it turns out she's brilliant. Right. Um, and so were those thoughts to kind of creep into her head now, like she has that experience to draw on. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm tying together all of those snippets of what I'm hearing you say. Um, and I'm really appreciative for that. Rebecca, I want to come back to you for just a moment because you mentioned breathing. Um, and I'm curious if you are thinking like specific types of breathing, like box breathing. Are you thinking um what what do you have in mind when you're suggesting that? I was kind of thinking of breathing that allows you to count along with that. So with a mantra, for example, I have prepared on the inhale counting one, two, three. I have prepared and then one, two, three, four, this performance, you know, measuring it out like that. Um, to, to make your breathing very slow and controlled. Um, just on another topic, I think, you know, one thing that's important to remember with any type of anxiety, usually the dread of the activity is a lot worse than the activity itself. Worry. You know, usually we worry about it so much, but then the event arrives and, you know, it's not so bad, you know, but we get ourselves up into a tizzy about you know with anxiety about this event and then it comes and you know then we wonder why were we so nervous you know yeah do you know do you know i work primarily with school-aged kids and do you know how many times when we're coming up onto solo and ensemble season i have to explain to the kids guys, this is not American Idol. There's not a panel of judges that are going to be heckling you, right? It's just, you're going to play for a grade. Um, and I sometimes think that, I mean, even, even up into college, into juries, um, like we feel like this, this more antagonistic kind of like pressure from the committee that's listening to you. But like you mentioned earlier, 
they're, they're wanting you to do well. I mean, they don't want to flunk out a whole bunch of the students from the school. Um, they want it to go well. And so reminding yourself of that, maybe, um, like reasonably speaking, the audience wants this to go well. They want to be there listening and they want to be there enjoying. And that might be something that's helpful as well. Okay, I have another question for you. Um, when does anxiousness become a problem that needs professional help? When do we need to step into the professional realm to help us deal with this? Rebecca, I think you had a particular interest in this one. Yeah, well, I think if it, it gets to the point where you're avoiding performing, you're canceling performances, um, it's impacting your career to that degree, then I really think you need professional help because then it's, you know, it's becoming detrimental to your career. If it's really impacting your mental health, if you can't eat, if you can't sleep, that's going to affect your physical health too if you're not eating or sleeping. And so then it's important to get medical treatment for the anxiety. Yeah, it could definitely be a deeper rooted issue you know, that you need personal help for. And here we are trying to just, oh, I need to practice more and all this. It's probably something deeper, you know, that you need to, to figure out. Yeah, and maybe like we were discussing, like how do you alleviate the symptoms, right? Right there in the moment, but there's only so many times you can alleviate the symptoms before maybe we need to find a root cause. Yeah, so what are some of some more of those symptoms? Um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from Megan. I'd be interested to hear from Sherry. What are some more of those symptoms that you look at and go, yeah, this might be a bigger problem? I really, I, I like what Rebecca had to say about it. It, it. When it starts to impact even beyond the, if it's not just performance anxiety and you're starting to notice this in your day to day, it's creeping into to everything about what you do. It might be, it might be something deeper. I think that people who are, uh, have anxiety are also a little predisposed to performance anxiety as well. And so sometimes finding that root cause, if you find that, you know, you, you go and you get talk therapy and you're able to work through some of the anxiety, I associate anxiety with fear. Um, and so working through that uh, can just have impacts on all aspects of your life, including your performance. Yeah, Sherry. It's interesting, um, Megan's uh, comment here, again, you're spot on. Um, hang on a second. Um, your comments are spot on. Um, there have been studies that demonstrate that people who are have an anxious personality, who are anxiety prone, are indeed much more likely to suffer performance anxiety symptoms. And again, as um, Rebecca says, if it's to the point where this anxiety is affecting your daily living, by all means, uh, it's something that needs, uh, that you need to seek professional help for. Um, you know, uh, there are people who get panic attacks and that's a severe form of anxiety. And in many respects, very severe um, performance anxiety really isn't that different. Um, there's a kind of a bell-shaped curve. And it is that if you have a little bit of anxiousness um, and you're on the left side of this curve, it's called a rainbow curve by some, um, that's good because it kind of, you're up, you know, you're, you're ready, you're up. Like the athletic um, analogy that Shannon brought up. You know, you got to be psyched. I got to be ready to hop on that bike and go out for that ride or whatever it is. Um, but if that keeps accelerating to the top of the curve to where it's an incapacitating thing, that is when your severe performance anxiety sets in. If it's that severe, 
Yeah, you need, uh, you need to get some professional help. Lots of different modalities uh, that therapists can offer. And um, there shouldn't really be a stigma to it, at least there used to be, but hopefully not so much now. Okay, so what I hear you saying is when um, when you see that it is spilling over into other areas of your life, when you see that it is keeping you from doing things that you intended to do, like that you had set out to do. Um, so then this is like, this is a kind of common thing that happens when you're talking about, um, we, we can talk about maybe like more like generalized anxiety disorders. Like there's all kinds of things that are listed out, right? Um, but, then, but then what tends to happen is you kind of look at them and go, is that me? right? Is that me? And so I'm going to come back to a similar question from what I asked earlier. And that is, where do we cross the line um, between like nervousness or jitters and like anxiety? Like what, what do you see as being a difference between those two? Megan, go ahead. I think of, and I think this is subjective as well, but I, I think of jitters is an excitement for me that leads to focus you're bubbly, you're excited, you're backstage, you're talking a mile a minute because you're excited about going into that that performance. I, I said this one earlier, I think of, of anxiety is associated with fear. Um, so, and they're very close together, fear and excitement. <laughs> I, I would say those emotions are very close together. Um, but just being able to know for yourself where that that exists. And I think everybody on the panel might give a different answer for this one. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I like the the association um, with an emotion, like being able to label. Like I feel not just anxious. I feel not just like jittery, but I actually can find a little bit of afraid in there, um, as opposed to maybe just being amped. Right? You're you're like got the the adrenaline. You know, maybe is still affecting you a little bit, but it sounds like you're less concerned um, by that and more concerned by the emotional attachment of fear to to that state. Would you agree with that? Am I am I hearing you correctly? Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Um. Last question. Last question. We're we're not quite hitting the hour, but it's it's close. Thank you very much again for your time. Um, but my last question is, can you think of a time? Can you think of a time you've some of you have already kind of like um, interspersed this into some other answers, but can you think of a time when your anxiety, your maybe performance anxiety, your nervousness was noticeably relieved? Can you think back to a time where you were feeling it? And can you think of what it was that just gave you a little bit more room to breathe? I think for myself, um, the way I prepared, preparing unconventionally for the performance was very important. So usually when we think of preparing for a performance, we think of just practicing and working on our reads. But you really have to prepare for the anxiety. One of the things I did um, that really helped, this may seem kind of strange, but you know, when you're feeling anxious, your heart races. So what I would do is when I was practicing, I would run up and down the stairs over and over again to get my heart racing and then try to play. And then I, at the performance, I was used to that feeling of my heart racing. And so it didn't feel so terrible and unfamiliar and I could get through it, you know, so that really helps. So I think preparing in, in unconventional ways is really important for performing. Yeah, that was something that that is so funny that you said that because I was I, for a short time I worked with an audition coach and he would have me do that. He'd be like, "Okay, go outside." He'd walk me outside. Okay, now go run to the end of the building and back. Like, just go run, go run as fast as you can. And then we would come back and we would sit down and he's like, "Okay, now pick up your instrument on the first take, like the first time you touch your instrument and play the excerpt." Right. And then I noticed that it wasn't 
the first time playing that caused as much of a problem as it was the second time because then he would be like okay now put your instrument down okay now pick it back up again and play it again and by then you had the chance for all of that that chemistry to happen right for where you started to feel a little bit more shallow of breath where you started to feel a little bit more shaky um and yeah the second time was always harder than the first time and again it's kind of like that getting used to what does that feel like yeah yeah that's so funny I've never heard anybody else do that like oh. like in conversation I've heard of other people doing it but I've never actually run into anybody else who's done it it really another, helps another thing you can do if you get cold hands or maybe you have cold hands normally is just, I've even had some people put their hands run their hands on like the coldest water mm -hmm. for like or in the refrigerator and, or or like take one of those you know, you don't want to hurt yourself or, you know, whatever, but you know, take one of those, put them in the freezer or put like those ice packs around and then, you know, take them off and go play. Yeah. Same thing. Mm -hmm. um, can any by the of you... same token, sorry. No, by the same it. token, you can also buy hand warmers. So, you know, if you do experience cold hands at a performance, you can get hand warmers online to combat that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you can wear fingerless gloves when you're practicing to warm up your fingers, just like students in marching band use. Yeah, yeah. that's a nice, that's a good idea. I, I don't think that's going to probably ultimately last or deal, help you, you know, last long term. But yeah, you could certainly uh, simulate it that way, I think. I like Rebecca's idea of you're practicing, you're putting yourself in the moment. Uh, one of our instructors here uh, tells his students to go run around the building and then come back in and, and play it cold after having run around the building. Um, but the idea of just blanket preparation in all all manners. So you're preparing for what it would be like in that performance situation, but you're doing lots of preparation. I find that I am most nervous when I don't feel like I've put in adequate time uh, on just learning and performing it uh, before or practice performance. So preparation in general is what, what helps me. It's interesting. I find myself in many different situations in performing, um, like Rebecca was saying. So maybe you find yourself in a hot, in a hot room. I have like hot concerts in the summer. So I'll do hot yoga in preparation for that. Or like I, I've done the running thing or I'll walk on my treadmill when I'm practicing my clarinet for like marching jobs, because those can be very nerve wracking as well. So yeah, putting yourself in that moment is important. Like, like Leonard, like Leonard Bernstein said, he said, there's two things that's that are necessary for a uh, great work or a great performance. He said, a, a plan and not enough time. <laughs> so you do the best you can with what you've got, you know, maximize what you've Thank got. You. Thank you. Um, okay, Sherry, Megan, Laura, Rebecca, Shannon, um, is there anything else that we have left out that you really want the community to know about their anxiety, um, about their students' anxiety, what what do you want to leave us with? Shannon, go for it. Just going to say something quick here. Something I tell my students, and something that I've told myself and even my fitness folks, is um, you know, do you imagine a smile on your face when you're done with that performance? You know, a lot of times we're focused on getting out there and performing, but are you imagining what you're going to feel like when you're done? You know, do you see yourself with a smile on your face when you're done with that performance at solo and ensemble or on the stage or wherever you might be at the audition? And I think putting yourself in that um, that mind frame or in, you know, seeing yourself when you're done with a smile on your face can really help you get into the moment. Megan. I said this earlier, but I really do believe it. Uh, that mindset that you're sharing a gift with your audience because not everybody can do what we do as musicians. And so if you think about it from that perspective, that always helps me. Yeah. Maybe instead of like thinking of it in terms of the business side of it, which we often in orchestras kind of, we need to draw, we need to like, we need to keep the donors donating. We need to keep the audience buying tickets. We need to deliver right instead of offering an invitation 
to join. Yeah, that's, that's cool. That's cool. Thank you for that. Um, Sherry, Rebecca. Sherry, do you want to go first? I'm not yeah, sure if ahead, you Rebecca. lost Sherry. Um, <laughs> I like to think of something humorous. My late father used to always say that made me laugh, you know, because so much of anxiety is worrying about what other people think, you know, and he had a Brooklyn accent. So it was very funny when he said this, but he would say, don't worry about what other people think. Most people don't think at all. And he would just say that, you know, most people don't think at all. Most people don't think, you know, and it would make me laugh and it would make me feel better. And I would stop worrying about what other people thought, you know, and, you know, I just remembering that the anxiety is worse than the actual event. You know, it's the anxiety we have to conquer. It's not the event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sherry? Well, along those same lines, Rebecca. I and it really is great to 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 laugh. I mean, laughing uh, relieves so many problems. Um, I had a teacher, um, and uh, he came over and wrote on this piece of music that I was going to be playing, the top in pencil, D V, and I said, "What? What is D V?" He said, "Don't worry." And uh, so I, I obviously started laughing, and that's another thing that I've done. If there's something that I'm concerned about, I'll write D V on the top of the music, and it makes me smile and laugh. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, you know, thank you so much, Shannon, uh, Rebecca, Laura, Megan, Sherry. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I, I really appreciate your candor. Um, I really appreciate your forthcomingness. And I really hope that our audience, um, both the one that's in attendance right now and the one that will listen later, um, will appreciate the realization that, you know, everybody gets nervous from time to time. And it's not something in and of itself to necessarily be afraid of. Um, and there are there are really workable ways to, to get through it. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, if you want to leave comments, you can. If you want to email us questions, we are available for that. Um, and we hope to keep this conversation going um, in multiple facets, by the way, uh, throughout the rest of the year. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great day. And on that Thank note, you. just one more thing. Um, we will be um, continuing this discussion at uh, the Clonet Fest 2024 in Dublin. So make sure uh, if, you, if you go there, the Health and Wellness Committee will be there. We'll have a session. You can ask questions and we can uh, we can answer straight on the spot. There's going to be a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety probably, but we've already learned. Um, also, I wanted to say that um, the ICA Health and Wellness Committee's uh, podcast episode for March is coming out next week. Um, it will be on an invisible, invisible illness by Susan Cowley. And in May, the following one will be on how fitness supports music by Shannon Hewitt. Um, so make sure you look out for that. And thank you for the participation. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, Catherine. Everyone. Thank you, all the pan panelists. It was a pleasure talking with you all. Thank you all.